Hi, and welcome to episode 48 of Susan Stanley Stitch in Time. I'm Susan, and on this channel, I typically talk about cross stitch, quilting, textiles, sewing notions from the past, dyes, and how they all interrelate, because I just can't, I can't break them apart, because they're all part of each other. Uh, I usually share my projects with you, and I have some exciting new uh, project that I'm uh, going to start introducing to you today. So we will look at my whips, some haul, we're going to learn more about Corliss and Faraby, and we'll take a peek at the secrets and the stitches, and I'll share a shop update. So here we go. Um, welcome to all of you who are watching. I am just so thrilled to have you here. If you are familiar with this channel and come back again and again, I just thank you so much. I love having you here. I love hearing from you. I can't tell you how exciting it is to know that there are other people on the other side of this camera who enjoy all of this stitching and textile goodness. Um, and a special welcome to any new viewers. I hope you are inspired and find this content interesting. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here as well and the current projects that I'm working on I can't separate from the people who've stitched in the past and that's why I I always am looking at their lives and find that interesting so um, all right let's take a look at my whips they I can't stop doing cross stitch and quilting and English paper piecing and applique I just do and patchwork it's like I love it all and I don't want to give it all any of it up uh, I just can't help myself sorry so join me I'll share my uh, current works in progress with you all right if you were if you've been with me you know that I mean even over time I put this aside for quite a while but I've been working on a, a cross stitch piece called the old Scott by hands across the sea samplers I've been super inspired by those of you who have finished it and very inspired by Sarah of Jane says eight and some of the things that she did to this um, to make it personalized Oops, excuse me. Hold. Um, so I'm stitching this in honor of my father, who uh, is from is of Scottish descent, and I'm personalizing it, and I'm making a lot of changes and adaptations to this. And I don't, I haven't typically done that with samplers. I I usually stay really true to the original stitcher, but this one is very personal, and so it's it's being personalized and it's becoming more and more personalized as I go uh, and um, I think I'm gonna be really happy with the results I'm you know I'm, I don't normally do that but I'm, I'm enjoying it quite a bit I am using platinum with a Verisois silks and so this time let me see if I can get this on here this time I I start I really worked on the flowers and I'm doing my own color changes to the flowers at the bottom, those pansies. I decided that I'm bumping up the colors and I'm doing each flower a little bit differently and the buds. And so that's one way that I'm adapting it. I also well, I also am planning, I think I'm going to make some changes in here. As I, as I do these colors on the flowers, I am going to add them into the flowers on the border, on that honeysuckle border. There are so many other people stitching this and so many people who have stitched it. I did add the quote, which is the motto for the town that my ancestors came from, which is Peebles, Scotland. And I did it in a very low contrast. I'm gonna hold it up and see if you can see it. It's right above that line. I don't even know if you can see it. I wanted it to be very discreet. It's right here. And I'll, I'll put the quote below. 
and it literally means thank you so much to the viewer who gave me the literal translation I was stumbling over I hadn't written it down and so I was stumbling over it last time but it means against the stream they multiply to me that just signifies like the fortitude of and the determination of my ancestors my father had that personality most definitely so um yeah it just it just had to go in there so all right so i'm messing around with the colors i've changed this alphabet to i'm going to try to spread it out across instead of leaving a big empty space at the end and uh I am going to change the gentleman in the doorway because he just he just kind of looks like a gargoyle and I was drawn to this because of his confident stance and just the way he looked like he could take on the world and that's kind of how my father you know that's how I remember him so I did a bunch of drafting and I did some uh, playing with some options and I had 22 stitches from side to side to mess around with and 30 stitches from top to bottom and so I drew out and he kind of almost looks a little bit like Robin Hood so I'm not sure um, I'm not sure I'm gonna stick with it but that's kind of what I'm going for a little bit a little bit less and I want a little, little bit less uh, like a worm head coming out of clothing. I don't know. It just, no offense to the little girl. So I wanted to adapt it to make it meaningful and personable, personal, personal to me. And so I, I will do the satin stitching here just like on the original and the buttons. I added a hat. I added uh, a thistle, which is you know, very loosely a thistle and a feather and gave him a little bit more defined shoes. I don't know. I might have to do a sample stitch of that before I put it on here because then I have to rip it out and that would be a problem. So tell me what you think. I did, I'll share, I'll share next time with you. I did a bunch of research on this chart and uh, maybe what the, maybe the meaning of this gentleman and some other uh, other people have stitched some very very similar samplers to this, and what what they did, and, for, and this is from the 1700s. So, uh, and after last time saying that I was going to leave this undulating intertwined vine right here, um, two of them were actually it was these two. They were off. I I decided you know what I'm adapting it. I'm just going to go ahead and fix that. That's a simple fix to kind of clean it up and um, I don't know make it look make it a look a little more like uh, it's my work and so I do I want to thank Ellen Chester as well she gave me some ideas for other Scottish samplers I can see a kind of a Scottish sampler ancestry wall in my future uh, it would be a lot of fun so that was something that I worked on. I should show you the silks. The silks are not as fun to look at on the camera because they're all packaged in baggies, but um, it's just, the colors are beautiful. And I have, like I said, I've added some colors and given it a little more depth. So this is really my first, one of the first samplers that I've um, kind of gone off the rails with and I'm, I'm actually having a lot of fun with it. it take me even twice as longer twice as long to put it together probably <laughs> but um, I'm having fun all right another work in progress is the needlework panel of a fruit tree with two animals by the scarlet letter if you've been watching me this is the original you know that I have been so sucked into this doing all kinds of rabbit hole research on the motifs and anyway it's just been fun so there's quite a bit of over one or you know more over one than I typically stitch but I'm getting there and I'm not gonna let it defeat me uh, I am stitching this on 
corkscrew, corkscrew willow with the Aberystwyth silks. And of course, it's the colors and the motifs. And I did tackle a little bit more of the two animals down there on the lower section. That whole lower section is over one. And I started outlining the animals with Swasser Fien, making full crosses, and I was really pleased with that. And then as I'm filling it in, I'm just doing a tent stitch with the um, Avera Soie, Soie Delge. And that seems to be working. I'm, I'm trying to block off this half and then just get all that over one done and then go up get all this over one done down here and then mo move up before I go across the top and then tackle the over one down here. Um, it's a small piece. It's full coverage. It's my first full coverage piece and I'm loving it. I have, let's see, Susie Lou O2 in Australia is stitching this. Uh, Contented Needleworker Kim is stitching this. I think I heard Karen Combs is stitching it. I don't know who else is. If you are, please let me know. I'd love, I'd love to follow you and watch your progress. Um, yeah, it's just inspiring. It's going, I'm, I'll probably end up framing it, although I think the shape, the square, is just ideal for, I don't know, um, possibly the cover, a covered box, the top of a box. I don't know. I'll know when I finish it. This is not dedicated to anyone. I am simply stitching this because I absolutely love the colors and I wanted to try full coverage piece and this just seemed to fit the bill for me. So uh, I'd love to get that done this year. We'll see if I stick with it and don't get too distracted by other projects. It just might happen. Um, okay. Oh, let's see. Do I have a... A note here. Oh, yes. Okay. I told you last time that I was going to, I had this favorite fabric. It's still a very favorite fabric, but I am ready to cut into it. I have a lot of it. Uh, it is from the old Sturbridge collection, so it's, it's in old Sturbridge Village. I was going to use it for my own finish on this adorable pin keep. Uh, little pear tree pin keep. So cute. So sweet. It's actually quite a bit bigger. This, this is quite a bit bigger than I initially thought. And so I have an idea for a finish and I also decided I'm going to adapt the colors to go with the fabric and I ordered a whole bunch of threads and a few of them came in, but not all of them. So I, I don't have anything to show you yet, but just to say that next time I'm gonna have some samples of what I might use for the pear, what I might use for the tree, and then just walk, we can walk through my experience of playing with the colors and making it work with this fabric for the finish. So I'm, I am really excited about that. Um, it's gonna be, it's going to be really sweet. I'm taking it away from primitive, making it a little more fresh and spring-like. Not that I don't like, you know, the primitive's great, but... Uh, and then I worked on, you know, I have some, I have several hexi projects going of my own, and I started doing hexagon framed medallion blocks, and I showed you one two episodes ago, and I worked, I did another one. And so the frame around, this is a center one solid piece of fabric here in the center. It's a chintz. I believe it's a Joe Morton. Uh, very, very reminiscent of an early chintz with the birds. And so I just made this frame. Now this is, uh, there's a quilt pattern that if I can, I'm going to insert right here. And this pattern, uh, this woman came out with this pattern, which is very contemporary, very modern fabrics. And she, she took it from antique quilts. So it's, it's so funny. So I'm going to, 
I'm gonna, you know, use her inspiration and the inspiration of the antique quilts and create my own and I'll, I'll do a different setting. I don't think I'm gonna do the same setting that she did. I'll create my own setting, but she, she definitely inspired me towards this. So I wanna give her credit. Uh, so that's what I've been working on. And um, now let me show you my haul. So I didn't go crazy purchasing things from market this year, although I could have. I have a couple things that I ordered that haven't come in yet, but I don't know why. I just, well, I do know why. They're just stinking cute. I got totally sucked in to the animal crackers and I bought the Maggie May and Miss Hazel because I have bunnies and squirrels in my yard and I have had in my yard for, you know, almost everywhere that I've lived and they're just so cute. And even though there's tons of full coverage or fill in, ooh, it's different. It's a diversion from samplers and I think I, I just wanted to do it so I did. And then I, I saw Laura shared this and I had to get it from Pineberry Lane, Hannah and Emma Foster. I love the girls. I love, I love the fact that she showed the antique. These are girls. I did, you know, in one of my very first floss tubes I talked about the girl and then someone said, oh, it might be a boy. And then I was like, oh, I did a bit of reading and realized that boys up until the age of five were dressed in dresses during this time period. Um, so, yeah, and you could tell based on the part of their hair and typically the toys they were playing with. So, anyway, I just thought this was really unique and different and of course I love, I'm totally a sucker for a dress. I don't know why. And that red house. So, I have I got some new acquisitions and I did get this book uh, samplers and sampler makers American school girl art this is 1700 to 1850 so so it's before my 1870 time period that I'm really looking at this year but I am really on the hunt for any information and I have found a little bit on samplers from Kentucky there's so much done on the East Coast there's just not a lot done on the um, other areas of the country and uh, I have a dream of stitching a sampler from each area that I that I explore and each area that I've lived in but I thought this was a great book to add to my collection and it, and it is it has some good information it has some good examples and I did buy a used book and it had uh, a little bit of musty odor to it but uh, I read that if you put a dryer sheet in between the pages it will remove that odor and it, it really did so that was uh, that's what I was uh, acquiring well since I saw you last all right I'm so excited to share the beginning uh, opening to Corliss and her stitching journey in 1870 last year we looked at Mary in 1840 this year it's Corliss in 1870, and she uh, she's delightful. I already love her. This year I'm looking at her stitching journey, and it includes sampler stitching and patchwork. And we're going to look at my two fictional girls, and first I'm going to talk about Corliss. She's 12 years old in 1870, and we're going to learn from them as they take their stitching journey and these stories are of course crafted around these fictional characters but based on writings and journals and uh, historic um, fictional non-fictional publications um, that I'll share with you as well along the way. So here's the story I've crafted about Corliss. I started a little bit of it last time. I'm going to continue this time. Here's a brief review and then um, new information about Corliss. Corliss grew up in Boyette, Kentucky, with her mother, father, and three brothers. And her life changed drastically 
when the Civil War broke out in 1861. And that war lasted until 1865. And by the end of the, the, of the conflict, Corliss had lost her mother and her three older brothers. And shortly after these tragic events, Corliss's father remarried. And she and her father began living with her stepmother and stepsister, Faraby. Now in Boyette at this time, a 12 year old girl did not have many educational opportunities. She pretty much exhausted everything available to her. And that issue along with growing tensions in the home led her father, who was a hemp farther, farmer and a broker of hemp products, led her father to seek a different living situation for Corliss. And it was decided that Corliss would go live with her mother's sister, Aunt Edith, in Louisville. Louisville. This was not uncommon during this time period. Aunt Edith was married and had three sons, and they had all survived the war. And of course, as you can imagine, Aunt Edith had a very soft spot for Corliss. And she, Aunt Edith was an accomplished needlewoman herself, and she was more than happy to take Corliss in and walk her through the necessary steps to becoming an adult and setting up her own household. These sewing skills that Corliss needed to learn were not necessarily for pleasure or, or for uh, decoration, although they were used for that as well. They were, they were necessities in her time. She had to learn these skills. So her trip to live with Aunt Edith begins with a rag, wagon ride to Henderson. This wagon ride with her father. And this wagon ride was a, a path that her father traveled frequently for business. And it was there in Henderson that Corliss was placed on a train to travel to Louisville by herself. This was also very common in this time period. Uh, times were difficult for everyone in both the North and the South, and this, the country was struggling to recover. And uh, part of Part of this journey for Corliss was not uncommon for other children who, due to financial necessity or uh, being orphaned by the war or uh, you know health issues, they were sent to live with someone else. So when Corliss arrived at Aunt Edith's house, she's quickly put to work. There was not a minute where she was idle. She was getting ready to attend all the social gatherings and her aunt had her busy with her first project which was to put some hexagons together for English paper piecing. And Aunt Edith directs Corliss to cut out papers from old letters. So any old letters or documents, every piece of paper that was still usable was saved. Um, cardboard was saved. Yes, cardboard was available in the 1800s. Um, letters, like I said, anything that was, was stable enough to be used as a hexagon base was saved and for this and other purposes. So she starts cutting out all her hexagons and what did she use to cut these with? Well, guess what? She used the same material that Mary used working when she worked on her patchwork, and that is tin. Except this time, the tin was a hexagon shape. And I found the most delightful quote about hexagon use on tin, hexagons on tin. It's it, and it's from a magazine from that time period, from 1860. And it talks about the materials necessary for patchwork, uh, anything that was wearing apparel, and anything that otherwise would be thrown away was sa or saved for the ragman, you could use this for your patchwork. No matter how small the portion, it had its use. The next article is some stiff paper, which 
Corliss found and she was cutting from to form the shapes. And lastly, the design element would be cut out of tin for the designs itself. And the materials should be arranged into shapes and qualities. And after having been cut to the requisite sizes, the irregular irregularities of the edges neatly remealed. When this is done, they are ready for use. The patterns may vary, and if the person's, person possesses the least talent for drawing or making, we submit the following simple and effective design. So basically that was your pattern in the magazine. They told you what to use, they told you go for it, make your shape, and they, and they said if you can't be creative and figure it out yourself, then here's a picture you can, you can use to emulate. I think that's delightful. So I was delighted to have my husband cut this tin template out for me. And please let me know if you would be interested in one of Aunt Edith's tin hexagon templates for your 1870s experience to keep in your work basket or whatever, whatever way you'd like to organize your supplies. Now, you know I like to set up work baskets and I'm kind of now setting up different work baskets um, and vignettes for different time periods. I definitely, I'm gonna put this in mind. So Aunt Edith shows her how to use the scraps in her scrap bag because scrap bags were still a huge and important part of a household. Aunt Edith let, let uh, Corliss go for it and she, I'm sure, enjoyed it like any Anybody who enjoys fabric does. And Corliss is very uh, prone to stitching. She likes stitching. We had to make her a, a stitching girl. So she shows her how to take the papers that she's cut from the traced tin and the fabric and cut, and she shows her how to cut the fabric just a tiny bit bigger, just like I showed you on the English paper piecing tutorial. And then she instructs her to fold the edges over the paper and begin basting them down. And I showed you the method I like to do in the tutorial. There are lots of methods, lots of people, but this is the method I like the best uh, because you have a prepared edge and you can, you can leave the basting threads in and keep your edge stable. Uh, so Corliss is going to be going to several social gatherings with her aunt and sewing events in in homes and at church, at, at church, in church settings. And she'll be bringing her hexagons to work on as her fancy work to be completed over time. This learning of how to baste and stitch together hexagons is a preparation or a precursor to the next skills that Corliss is going to be learning in her stitching. And at these events, Corliss is gonna be exposed to so many sewing projects She'll be exposed to quilts and all different, all manner of things that the ladies are working on. And many of the ladies are generous and they're happy to share additional scraps with Corliss for her project. Um, and this was common too. And you know, don't you know, aren't we still like that? We love sharing and we love trading and, and uh, embellishing our collections with things that we don't have from someone else and sharing with them. So sharing was a common occurrence Although, some stitchers back then took advantage of it, and I have this funny quote from the blog I told you about last time, Two Threads Back. This was a written publication where a woman was gossiping, because there was always a gossip column, and I will link this Two Threads Back blog to, for you. And it says, regarding patchwork, I have an old female cousin who has passed a quarter of a century in rags, or rather amidst patches, destined to a most marvelous arrangement for the furniture of a suite of apartments, a saloon, a boudoir, and a bedchamber. She began her paltry collection by begging of all her acquaintance and wearing out everyone by messages, notes, and applications for odd bits and patterns. <laughs> Patterns meaning patterned fabrics. So, you know, 
Corliss is going to be exposed to all of that as well. And as she learns and becomes, you know, ready for adult life. She's learning all this and you can too. And our first look at her stitching involves the English paper piecing that I offered to you a few episodes ago and is still available. The tutorial is up and the kit, the starter kits are available on my website. And many of you have jumped in for the fun. Some of you have told me that you've done this before and you love English paper piecing. I had someone tell me, um, and I won't say who, you know who you are if you're watching, say that uh, she'd made a ton of these hexagon, basted hexagons, but she wasn't sure at all what to do with them, so she was so glad for the tutorial. So uh, this, like I said, is a precursor to the next more formal project that Corliss will undertake. And uh, I, I love hearing from you if you've tried this for the first time. I've been reposting some of the images that I'm getting from people who are trying it. And so far, I think everybody's liking it. It is, it is relaxing. I can't, I can't say that I, I can't say anything bad about it. Uh, English paper piecing. It's, it is very fun. So there is a book, the American Girls book. It was published in 1831 and it's also available through open access. And it has a really cute quote in it about hexagon patchwork because this patchwork was going on like in the 1700s. It was going on in England before it came to America. And I'm sure that's how it was, it was brought here. Uh, but it states that it's a great activity to keep children busy and perhaps there's no patchwork that is prettier or ingenious than a hexagon or six-sided. This is also called honeycomb patchwork. So you may see it referred to all as all those different ways. Uh, so Corliss would have been doing this along with a lot of children her age. And so we talked about this last time in Mary, 1840, that there were acceptable norms for sewing. And there was the household sewing that included a work basket for patchwork and darning and mending. And it would have, you know, all the tools needed in that work basket for those kind of projects. And then there was the fancy work. And the fancy work was done outside of the home in social settings. Uh, it was not the work of the house. It was uh, things like making hexagons and putting patchwork together and embellishing garments and uh, making quilts. Uh, so Aunt Edith is going to help Corliss as she enters this new social realm. And so Aunt Edith is, like I said, an accomplished needlewoman She's made her own wrappers and she has leftover pieces uh, that she will be saving, that she has saved as soon as she found out Corliss was coming to live with her. Um, and Edith sends her, her dressing gowns out to be made by a seamstress or um, dressmaker. And in those times, the dressmaker kept the cabbage or the leftover pieces from the dressmaking for her, for themselves, it was part of uh, additional payment for them. But since Aunt Edith makes her own wrappers, she's um, she's got plenty of scraps for Corliss. And so here's a little peek at some of the leftover pieces Aunt Edith has. She has this gorgeous palette of fabrics that she's collected and put aside in various shapes and sizes for use by Corliss. Now these are bigger pieces and she set them aside so they aren't in the scrap basket right now. Mm, so pretty. And she shows these to Corliss and Corliss of course is delighted and I couldn't help myself, I had to show them to you too. Uh, so the cabbage from Aunt Edith's construction of these wrappers is what Corliss is going to use for her next project. Now, you might be surprised at some of those colors and you might think, well, that doesn't, I don't know if that's 1800s 
I assure you it is. And I'm gonna, I just wanna pop in a few other fabrics that will maybe surprise you as um, they are really bright and they were from the late 1800s and they were dress fabrics. And they also ended up in quilts. These are beautiful fabrics that have been, these two particular fabrics had been reproduced by a woman named Terry Clothier Thompson. But look at some of these colors. I mean, do you really, you know, many times we associate the 1800s with brown and there was a lot of brown, but wow. So think about samplers. Think about some of the colors in samplers that you you say, wow, that yellow is bright or those dyes, those colors were available. Those dyes were available. And as dyes became synthetic and stable, they could even go farther with them. Um, so yeah, I just thought that would be fun to show you. So what is a wrapper? You might be saying, Susan, you keep using this word wrapper. And you know, I'm not talking a R A P P E R. I'm talking about a W R A P P E R. And so a, a wrapper was a house dress. It was something that was only worn in the home without a corset. And it was not a dress you would wear when you were accepting visitors. It was something you would wear in your private domain. It's also referred to as a peignoir um, or a morning dress. By 1870, they started referring to these outfits as tea, tea gowns. And so uh, I'm going to show you a few examples. These are from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. These are dresses that were basically house coats. They were not at all appropriate for outside the home. This is only what you would wear. I think some of the fabrics are so gorgeous. Uh, I can't believe they were only allowed in the house. So let me pop a couple of those in here for you to look at. So Corliss' first project with Aunt Edith is something that I have been crafting and working on since last year, and I'm really excited about it. I can't wait to reveal all of it to you. Um, there's going to be a new class that I'm going to be offering soon, and I want to be sure if you take this class that you get the full 1870s experience as we join Corliss learning to sew as she would have been taught by her aunt. It will be different than Mary because Mary was a much younger child. Corliss is now entering this social realm of sewing and it's a passage for her to becoming an adult and, and other younger girls at this time. And it was preparing her to have her own household and to manage that, whether it was marking the linens or uh, constructing clothing items or curtains or any other textile. It was going to be her responsibility. There weren't stores, you know, there were dressmakers, but that would depend on, you know, your means. So I'm super excited to share with you uh, the next step in Corliss's journey. If you've ever read Little, The Little House on the Prairie books or remember those by Laura Ingalls, You'll remember that she was doing much the same. She was being taught uh, everything from making butter to uh, patching quilts to stitching. Everything was done. You know, needlework then and now still is such a huge social connector. I mean, how many of us look forward to and dream about retreats where we're going to be together and stitch? Uh, there's just some kind of a connection and a bond that happens when we've got our needles in hand and we're, and, and we're stitching with our thread and uh, we're just doing it side by side. Uh, it wasn't any different in 1870 and it was a foundation for, the so, for social life in the community. Um, now sometimes the ladies met weekly in either, you know, in homes or at churches and they would bring their children 
to these events and some of the girls who were old enough would, would join the older women and stitch and others were given the responsibility of watching the younger children and sometimes uh, someone would read. They would read poems, they would read passages out of novels, they would read the gossip section in the newspaper uh, or any other pertinent event information. They would read passages out of the Bible. Uh, others in the group would prepare the meal for the day and sometimes in the evening the, um, the rest of the family would join and they would all have a meal together. They would undertake charity work and they would do group projects to raise money for philanthropic events and to, to um, help the needy. This was kind of uh, a social network at this time. And Corliss would have learned so many skills just from being there and from observing and just being a part of it. She would have learned all kinds of life lessons. She would have learned practical sewing tips. She would have learned a lot about life uh, as she listened to the gossip and the conversations around her. So let me know um, in addition to this class that I'm going to offer, let me know if you would like additional information and discussion on the, the material culture and what was going on in Kentucky in, in that area during this time. Uh, I would do more stitched stories. This would be part of stitched stories. Let me know if you're interested in that. Uh, this is Corliss. She's in Kentucky. It's 1870. What else was going on? What else could have impacted her? Yeah, so give me a comment if you if that's something that you think, yeah, Susan, do that. I would I'd like to hear more. It's just something you can listen to as you're stitching. So Corliss is off now living with Aunt Edith, and Farah B, her stepsister, who is nine years old, is left at home with her mom and her stepfather. And Farabee is now going to start her stitching adventure, which is probably the first stitching experience many young children had, and that was a marking sampler. And I found two from the, around the 1870 time period. Last year I did a marking sampler in honor of Mary, 1840 of St. Louis. I found an 1840s marking sampler and stitched it uh, I couldn't find one from St. Louis, Missouri. I can't find one from uh, Boyette, Kentucky or Kentucky at all. If you know of a marking sampler, even from the United States from this time period, or you have a favorite marking sampler from this time period, let's say 1865 to 1875, I sure would love to hear from you. I'd love to know, I'd love to know what it is. So I found two options that I'm considering. One is A. Mensing 1872 by Pineberry Lane. And both of these marking samplers happen to be done on um, in red, which I thought was kind of interesting. And uh, this one's on a finer linen than the second one, which is Amy Florence Ogilvie by Hedgerow Stitching. This was a PDF download. This one's on a very coarse linen. This is the antique. Both of these charts show the antique, which I find really nice. Uh, yeah, so, and it looks like this one was stitched with wool. And, um, you know, I would love to, I mean, do you see a difference between these 1870 marking samplers and the ones from 1840? I would love to know your thoughts on that too, because I, I see a huge difference and we'll talk about that a little bit, but I'd love to hear from you and, and uh, just find out what you notice as being a huge difference. And then also, uh, you know, if you are only a quilter and watching me, or you're kind of only, only a cross stitcher and watching me, or maybe you do both, or maybe you're a knitter or, you know, and you just like having company while you work, um, you know, perhaps I can entice you or encourage you to try stitching something that's new and different. And if you want to try stitching a marking sampler, I have, I have a tutorial that I did on stitching a quilt label. Basically, it's just stitching numbers and letters, and that's pretty much what you're going to be doing on a marking sampler. Uh, you can try it. You can do it. 
I promise you, and uh, you can. And I would love love you to join me and stitch along an 1870 uh, marking sampler as we experience the stitching journey together of these two little girls. Two episodes ago, I introduced you to a new tiny mini series I'm going to add into my floss tubes, which is Secrets in the Stitches, where we are going to look at an antique textile, either a quilt or a sampler or something, and kind of try to discover what we can about it, what dates we might attach to it, uh, if there is any in information about the item. The first item I'm talking about is this quilt, and I will insert a picture right here. This quilt was donated to me by a lovely viewer, and we're calling it Lexi's Quilt. And already we found out that the fabrics feel like they're not They've not been washed, uh, some of them, the outer fabrics and the internal fabrics feel soft, like maybe they had been from dresses and used quite a bit. And in video 46, I shared with you a view from the back and we took a look at the stitching. And I had a great comment from somebody after that video who wanted to know if the stitches were were stitched in the same manner that I taught you for the Mary 1840 doll quilt project, which is three stitches ahead and one stitch back. And I didn't find evidence of that in Lexi's quilt, but I was, I was given some uh, pictures of some other patchwork that was in Lexi's collection. And that had evidence of the exact same method of stitching as I taught you in Mary 1840. So I'm going to insert a picture right here. I have a pointer pointing to the back stitch. So you can see the three stitches forward and then a back stitch and then three more stitches and a back stitch. Uh, she had done this patchwork in exactly the same manner that we, we did approach the Mary project. So let me insert that picture right here. I was really excited to see that and the person who donated the quilt to me also has several blocks that she's putting together uh, and using and she said she'd send, send me any extras so I'm very much looking forward to that. She did uh, also send me these cardboard templates that were in Lexi's quilt memorabilia. I believe they were probably templates used for patches and uh, I'm delighted to have them and I'll keep them with Lexi's quilt. Uh, we'll take a deeper look next time at some of the fabrics in the, in the quilt. I did wanna to read to you a tiny bit about Lexi. It looks like that her paternal grandfather was a drummer boy and a musician and uh, during the Civil War. And so uh, as I uncover more about her life and her history, I'll, I'll share that with you too. But uh, I wanted to let you know that, yes, those stitches that you did for the Mary Project, if you participated, uh, they were alive and well in, in, the early, in, in the 1800s. All right, I also would like to give you an update on the shop. I have uh, the scissors will be coming soon, I hope. I think I have all the cases ready and if you have given me your name on the interest list I will be contacting you to let you know when the scissors will be coming and when it's time to make payment. If you are still if you are interested in scissors you can go ahead and contact me and let me know. Uh, and also like I said there are hexagon kits available, there are Mary kits available, there's lots of opportunities to learn some of these stitches and do some of the stitching. Um, on my website. So please join me if you have any questions. As always, please ask. I'm happy to help and would really enjoy that feedback. So next time we'll take a look at uh, 
future further progress on my whips and uh, hear a little bit more about uh, Corliss and Faraby. And hopefully I have those threads from the little pair color choices and I can uh, share those with you as I start doing my conversion for that and adapting that um, to go with that yummy fabric that I'm dying to, dying to reproduce or re adapt my, uh, my stitching to. So, uh, in the meantime, thank you for joining me today. I love, love, love hearing from you. And, uh, as always make time for stitching. Bye friends.